Let me tell you a story about the baddest dog that ever was. Sneaking food from the fridge, tearing up the garbage. He's a goofy old Dexter the dog. He's a bad, bad Dexter the dog. The baddest pup that there ever was. Seat stealing all day long. Howling like a junkyard dog. Hi, and welcome to the first episode of Ask Tanya. I want you to think of Ask Tanya as sort of a Dear Abby video series. So I want you to be able to ask me some questions, and I'll answer them on air, either recorded or live on Facebook, and you'll be able to get some quick answers and some quick tips to some of your pressing questions. Now, this is going to be recorded today, and you may actually hear my little monkey over there in the corner, Dexter, because I did a little removing of some things to make sure the background is a little clear for you, and so the flowers that are normally behind me that look like they're coming out of my head are now over there on our kitchen counter and Dexter of course the Snoopy pants that he is he thinks that it's something that he needs to check out so that background whining is him trying to say what is up there and let me see what it is so I went through um, yesterday and I posted a little link to give you the opportunity to submit your questions and I had about 15 that came in last night um, so I'm just gonna go over one of them today Day that I thought would be a good episode for you and I think I'm going to go ahead and remove those flowers for Dexter this see it's just that okay that's it All right, hopefully Dexter is taken care of and he got a chance to sniff the flowers. So I'll just kind of go over a little bit about that. So Dexter is what we call our Snoopy pants. And so when we have something new in the house or something's changed, he wants to see what it is. He wants to make sure that everything's okay. So I, it's pretty funny because I actually had the flowers over there. I let him smell them and then I put them over there and now he's sitting there looking at them. Um, something that's been there for a couple months now. So whatever, dog. Dogs are silly, cats are silly, and that's okay, and that's why we love them. Um, but I had a question, um, and it was from Susie Q, and the question was, I'm asking about my daughter's dog. He is a four-year-old and horrible on walks. He barks at people and does not listen. We have tried the pincher collar and treats. He also barks at the neighbors and does not listen. Well, sometimes. Any suggestions? So that's a pretty complex question, um, and there's actually a lot of things that are going on. So for this Ask Tanya, I just want to offer some simple, short tips. So this is not to address the behavior in depth, because if Miss Susie Q really wanted to get some extra help, um, well, first, it's her daughter's dog. So that's always a bit of a red flag for me, because training, dog training, cat training, anything like that, it really needs to be all the time part of their life. And when someone's emailing or calling me and asking for help for somebody else's pet, it's probably not going to be very successful because the person that really needs to address the issue is the one that has the pet, is the one that owns the, the dog or cat. So hopefully these tips will be able to be transferred to Susie Q's daughter and hopefully her daughter will take them to heart and maybe see some help. Um, so let's see, the first one is horrible on walks. Now, it sounds like the dog's horrible on walks because he's addressing some behavioral issues. So it's not just that he's just a polar like a lot of dogs are, but there's some issues that are, that are happening that's making him be horrible on walks. Again, this is just a quick paragraph and just some quick tips, so I'm just going to try to do the best that I can. So he barks at neighbors and does not listen. Um, and I'm guessing this is part of, of the walk, too. And I'm guessing he does a lot of barking at people during that walk as well. So the dog probably has some issues with people. He Probably most behavioral issues actually stem from fear and anxiety. And the dogs tend to learn to cope by um, acting like a bully. You know, bark, 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 lunge, lunge, lunge. I'm going to threaten you first so that you don't invade my space. But either way, whether it's because he's a bully or, or not, 
the training is pretty much the same. So the first part of the training is, well, I would ditch the pinch collar, right? So um, we don't want to use anything that's negative in the sense that causing the dog pain, discomfort, anxiety, or stress. That would be the pinch collar. So obviously I would dump that pinch collar right away. Um, and I would want to make sure that everything's positive, light, and fun for the dog so that we can build up that confidence and that trust and not having those walks be stressful. Um, depending on the breed or how big the mom is who's walking him, the daughter, um, and how big the dog is, I would either probably go to a front clipping harness, which is a harness that has an attachment to the front, so that when the dog does pull, if we have those oops moments, which pulling isn't going to be our ideal, but if we have that quick pull, the leash would attach to the front and we'll be able to turn the body and turn the head to refocus the dog. Um, if the person walking the dog is small or frail and the dog's big, then we might consider a head collar, which goes over the nose and back behind um, the ears, back here, and then the leash gets attached here, not on the neck. Now, I don't always go to head collars first anymore because we can do... One, it takes a lot of time for the dog to get comfortable with them. We don't want to just slap them on and go for a walk. The other one is the person that's actually attached to that leash has to be really aware of what's going on so that the dog isn't, you know, just pulling and doing one of these and kind of getting an, an uh, issue with the neck or pulling the dog really quickly and, and hurting that neck. So again, we just have to have care when we're using head collars. Um, so again, either a head collar or a front clipping harness, depending on, on what's going on with the dog and, and who the handler is. Um, I would always wear a harness. I don't ever, and I'll show you some links below, um, I don't ever use a collar, a buckle collar that attaches to my dog. Um, I'm pretty much a harness person, and again, head collar if, if needed, um, so that I'm not doing any damage on the dog. And then we want to make sure that the treats are good. We want to pair things up with, with good rewards and, and good food. Um, and again, these rewards as well want to be high value. I tend to go to meat, um, and just meat-based only, so dehydrated beef, dehydrated salmon, or, or something like that, rabbit, um, nothing added to it, no preservatives or any other fillers or anything else, so that when I'm rewarding my dog or, you know, the dog at the end of the leash, they're getting pretty much straight meat, so I can reward often, and I can include that meat as part of the dog's daily calories. So the training episodes are part of the calories, and the, again, the meat will make that value high, so hopefully they'll be able to go, wow, mom's got meat, this is really good. Okay, so the next part is we need to reassociate these people, the things that are scaring the dog or making the dog bark, at a distance that the dog doesn't react. And that is key. Because if you're setting your dog up to fail, you're putting them in a distance that doesn't matter if you waggle that, that treat in front of them, they're still like, there's a human, I need to bark at them. I have this set of emotions whenever I see a human. If we have that, it's not going to work. We need to say, my dog doesn't respond to a person when they're 20 feet away, 50 feet away, 100 feet away. I don't know what your ex is. you got to find your ex. What's that distance between that human, you having a high-value meat treat, and your dog, that your dog is able to focus on you, take the reward, and not care that that human is over there? That's the key. If you're not setting your dog up for success and he's always going over threshold and he's always barking and lunging and even if he turns back to get the treat afterwards, but you're consistent is he's barking lunging first, he's overreactive, he doesn't want to eat his treat, he's too wound up, then you're not at the right distance. And I know that can be hard. You know, sometimes that distance, my last dog was reactive, um, not towards people, but towards other dogs. And my distance was a football field. I literally had to have friends set their dogs and them up at the end of the football field distance and me and Theo over here to be able to start our conditioning. That's where we had to be. We weren't able to go to parks. We weren't able to go onto certain, you know, walks around the neighborhood because people would come out of their house and then my dog would go over threshold. So we have to find that distance first that they can be successful. And then gradually, over time and training and conditioning, that distance goes from whatever, 20 feet to 15 feet to 10 feet to, you know, whatever that distance is. But it does take time. And it has to take practice. And you have to be able to set your dog up for success and help them get to that point. Um, there's things that we can do to help 
move that along. I can't really recommend those over this because I don't know the history. But there's certain calming aids, natural calming aids, and, and herbs and supplements and, and flower essences and things like that can that can help a dog. Um, but it really depends on some more information. So I won't be able to say this dog can take this and this would be really good. I would really need to know what is going on. So that's my little Ask Tanya for today. Um, I will put some links below to some other helpful articles that relate to, to this question that hopefully some other people will be able to you know read and, and get some more information. Um, I will also add a link to the Ask the Tanya link up so that you can submit your question and that hopefully I'll be able to address it in one of the upcoming episodes. Um, and as always, I always offer in-home sessions for people living in the Toledo, Ohio area. And I also offer phone and Skype sessions for people that are outside of the Ohio area. And that works out just fine. Um, I'm able to get a full history on, on you and your dog or, or your cat and be able to set up a time that we can call or do a Skype session and kind of get you, uh, you know, get you going and see what's going on. Um, privately, I do see clients and I offer the behavior form is actually over 100 questions. So that's given me a lot of background information versus, you know, my little four liner. But hopefully you enjoyed today's episode of Ask Tanya. And again, don't forget to comment below and follow those links and submit your questions and we will see you next time.